Physical dynasty survived by transcending the physical limitations of genetic bloodlines. The more conscious can be no more dependent on their ancestors than they are on death and their progeny. Do you not stand alone, you perish. That is the only mental law known to the hero. The deranged prince climbed to the top of his father's castle and threw himself from the highest window into his waiting arms below. And you're supposed to say the king's or his own. The reminder to live heroically is not a matter of strength, but of alertness. If you die passively, you go down in defeat. If you die unyieldingly, you go out heroically. Now, for the concept of death, substitute that of, that of ignorance, and you've got it. The king asked the royal mythmaker, Is it possible to make the mystical hero sound too cold-blooded and indifferent? And the scribe poked the monarch in the ribs, chuckling, Ah, get out of here, old dear. I was going to use some more, for those of you who might be turning in to this for the first time, the description of the hero regarding people who would be interested in such as this and remind you that it has nothing to do with ordinary conceptions of a physical superman or to cover all, all possible contingencies if you can stretch your mind. It has nothing to do with anyone who would be perceived to be a hero. Having said that, consider... If you have no aspirations that are beyond that of collective man, then you actually have no aspirations of any note. I could have said, if you have no aspirations, higher. And that always brings about... The possibility of certain glee and also of resistance according to whether you found yourself to be a would-be supporter of such ideas and activities as this or whether you find it ludicrous. But to say it's above makes it sound like there's always a superior calling that fits into the idea of a hero of those involved with such as this of being much better people in all respects. If you think you're a much better person, you're not. If you think you're a much superior person, you're not. Except at the ordinary level. And then you'll always find somebody to agree with you, and you'll always find somebody ready to punch you in the nose over it. That is not heroic. But what I want you to consider, again, was that if, when I say your aspirations, I mean it in the highest possible sense. If you do not aspire to anything that is beyond that which is expressed, by the collective, then you're not on to anything. And there are no exceptions to this. And it has nothing to do with the, or, with the collective idea of what is proper, because that changes gradually. Or you could find a great shift if you ask the collective, this is no great importance, but so that you'll see what I'm, the general area in which I'm pointing. But you would find the aspirations of the collective to be different if we picked out one area of the globe right now and then went on the other side of the world and picked out a group of people. It might take a bit of selectivity, but you would find their general aspiration could be different, noticeably so. That does not matter. There is a common level of aspirations. There is a common paradigm that life installs in people, in humanity's minds, of what is proper aspirations. Obviously, you have the instinctive aspirations to stay alive, which is not what we're speaking of. Beyond that becomes what appears to be or what is taken to be the purview of man's intellect or his creative energies. The entire world of civilization, everything above the instinctive level, that is taken to be wherein man aspires to that which makes him worthy of the title man. Now, what I've noted that if your aspirations do not expand beyond that, then you have none. You're not involved with anything worthy of any note, no matter what you think. 
Do you understand that what I've just said is in no way a criticism? It can't even be taken as a criticism of any collective aspirations you can name. It doesn't matter what. You cannot yourself choose that, well, I have higher aspirations than uh, people did in the Middle Eastern base, base uh, 2000 B.C., it doesn't matter. Or you can say that you are now to bring it into contemporary times. If a man believes and says, but if he believes that his aspirations are on par with that which is highest in civilized, sophisticated, educated people, even in a religious sense, a moral sense, a humanistic sense, he has no aspirations. Whatever is the highest degree of the collective aspirations of humanity at any given time will not do. It's not because they're wrong. It's only ordinary minds that would then take such an idea and believe that it is an attack, even a veiled one, on some particular faction, on some particular belief system. And it's not. Whatever you picked out, whatever you in the past, whatever your ordinary mind may have found to be the highest level of would-be achievement on your part. That is, if you, if you were the sort that you believe that the Christian ideal, the Buddhist ideal, the Confucius, Confucian idea of a wise man, if you believe that that was the absolute best expression of what a man should be, that that is the best verbalization of what would be the model of a more enlightened person, let's take it from there. If that's the highest you can aspire to, nothing will happen. Uh, let me retract higher since I already put it to you another way. If your aspirations do not go beyond that, and the reason I hesitate is, again, so that you would not be inclined to take the ordinary level of collective aspirations or take it to be that I am criticizing it when I say higher. It must be beyond it. If you had some... Cons that's got to be clear, whether you like it or not. <laughs> it is thus that you're left always trying to move where there is nowhere discernible in which to move. No new place to stand. And I know I keep talking about the whole idea of being in the higher end of man's nervous system. Let me remind you, my, one of my older drawings of the man and his nervous system. And I don't have all the different colors, but if you recall, I used to be a bit more specific for other reasons. And I would draw out what a man to interlocking circuits within a man that crudely put, could be referred to as the kind of circuitry primarily responsible for his physical existence and that which seems to be primarily concerned with his emotional existence and that of the intellectual. These two, of course, well, skip it for now. <laughs> but within that sense, the physical people, the simpler people of the world, of which there are plenty, of which there are plenty in you. But the simpler people of the world, their aspirations amount to what? It's not a criticism, it's a fact. Their criticisms amount to little more than is denoted by my description of it being the circuitry primarily involved with a man's physical existence. Because what are they concerned with? Under the harshest of conditions, they're still involved with mere physical survival, eating, etc., if they are now within external conditions wherein such pressing needs are not their very life, day-to-day uh, -day drive for existence, then it becomes a matter of entertainment that they have some free time. What are their searches for entertainment? It's always of a physical sort. Even their ideas of a hero, which is emblematic of what they aspire to. But who are the heroes of simple people throughout the world? Warriors, knights, athletes, the same thing. They're paid better. 
<laughs> and then the emotional would seem to most people to be man's uh, artistic, creative endeavors. And then the intellectual, which would to most people be his uh, pure science, technology, the world of technical inventions. That that would seem to be the bailiwick of the intellect. But there's another way in which to look at also. Is you can look at the physical as being man's past. The physical circuitry is still tied to man's past. This is all primarily speaking. And it is not discrete in any way because they are interlocked. And there are no three separate wiring systems in man. But you can look at the physical as being the past. You can look at the, the center circuitry as being man's emotional present. And the intellect as being his potential future. They are all interlocked. They're all intertwined. The emphasis in most people, once you see it, is fairly distinctly emphasized. It is not that hard, just with run of the male people, to observe which seems to be their greatest interest in life. And it gets sometimes, what I started to say, I know it gets sometimes problematic as to trying to divide up these two because it usually ends up the easiest way to see it, I'm not saying that you can't see it in a more distinct manner, but it ends up that they're mostly driven instinctively. The aspirations of a simple man, of the simple people of the world, or the aspirations of your simplest side, if you believe that they have any transcendental value, if you think they have any individual value, then there's really nothing else to say to you. If you find, if your dreams, that's what I mean by aspirations, but dreams sound pretty childish, but if what's, what seems to be your dreams of what would be a more heroic you, or your kind of dreams of an, an external hero, someone to you, if it goes no further than athletics, if it goes no further than sexual prowess or attractiveness, if it goes no further than wealth, if it goes no further than having the biggest car on the block or the biggest house on the block, if it goes no further than that, you surely understand there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's as far as it goes, and your ideas of a mystical hero, if your ideas of Buddha, to use a metaphor, if your real concept of him was a guy that could whip everybody's ass that he, <laughs> that he ran across, that he could run faster, that when they played touch football, everybody wanted him on their side. If that's it, then I assume you realize uh, you might as well have... Your, your extent of metaphysical involvement amounts to having a plastic statue on your dashboard. <laughs> if it goes much higher than that, a bit more sophisticated, your ideas then become what used to be called, uh, fall into the occult range. Nowadays, it's sometimes called New Age, but it's still the idea of mortal magic that... Uh, your aspirations would be, even if you believe that you were interested in things of a extraordinary nature, of a metaphysical, of a mystical nature, your idea then would be, for instance, to use again emblematically speaking, your idea of a Jesus would be somebody who can literally raise the dead, heal the sick, do magic tricks, you know, make an 8-inch pizza, magically turn it into a 12-incher with no additional call. <laughs> it is the idea... It is the idea almost of being able to cloud men's minds to create what appears to be magic at the mundane level. It is, in general, to be a magician, to be an occultist, someone dealing in the black arts, someone dealing in magic. If you get much higher than that, which is, gets very difficult to even find at the ordinary level, simply because things have not progressed collectively much higher than that. But to get the idea for people to have an ordinary person, and I'm using this in my descriptions now to represent an ordinary person, or else I would not take the time to make a damn right-handed open palm gesture. That's a, <laughs> to an ordinary person. But to, it's hard-pressed about me saying so. I could take a few moments and let everyone think about it. To conceive of humanities or any aspect of collective humanities notions of a hero based more on the intellectual base, uh, realm, in the realm. Where are you going to go? You might find, just give an example, just make it up. If we had a, if we had a, 
elementary or a secondary school with a thousand kids in it and you ask them their hero, what would we figure? Would one pick out Einstein, <laughs> Niels Bohr, Clark, Kant, one? I'm not saying that they should, but you understand. Out of a thousand, what we'd have over 900 probably picking out uh, sports heroes. And you would have maybe a dozen, maybe a couple of score in the arts, maybe a little more nowadays, taking into consideration uh, music, uh, entertainment populated by those approaching or near their own peer age. So you might have you know, a couple of score there, but you would be hard pressed to find this illusionary or my imaginary thousand group of students in which one would pick out someone that would just be, relatively speaking, comparably speaking to the athletes and all that you just identify, well, he's just an out and out intellectual Einstein, so I picked that. You'd be hard pressed to find one. Now, that's simply the way things stand. It's not right or wrong. It is simply also a vertical reflection of my description of the collective parade of humanity going this way. That's all it is. That's as far as the parade has gotten. It is much bigger at the rear end as, than it is up front. Not unlike some, well, no need to be offensive, is there? See, because some of you are afraid I was going to say that, and I know you tried to tuck in your buttocks and sit up to where you didn't, where you didn't look so bottom heavy. At the ordinary level, by the way, everybody's bottom heavy. So, there you go. There it is. That's why you're bottom heavy. Not in a physical sense. You can always do something about that. Without any great effort. The aspirations of man. Here's what I was trying to get at. Where you, under, where you understand that there is nothing wrong. And it's tied into where I sort of left off in the last taping. Pointing out that there is no actual celebration of the heroic in the collective life of humanity. It never has been. They throw it in as a punchline. They throw it in as a moral after they've given you two hours worth of a blood and guts rape and pillage movie or piece of literature. They'll give you a 30 seconds at the tail end represented by the good guys win. The moral is, hey, goodness pays. Non-goodness doesn't. And nobody questions the fact, well, maybe if you say it doesn't pay, but compared to two hours worth of exchange of emotional or intellectual physical rep representation of a physical man's life or physical behavior, a two hours worth of exchange, I got 30 seconds worth of the moral. There is a very good reason. It's why I threw in also that you could look at on the physical life of man as being his past and the yellow circuit what seems to be his emotional present because that's the only way that people feel emotions generally is in the present and the only reason that they feel emotions is because the higher end of the nervous system right the brain stem is like everything else is tied to man's mind and men would not have emotions none of us would be talking about there would never been any conception of emotions without man having a mind. The only way that man has emotions, in one sense, as some of you know, I have, from a different direction, talked about it as though emotions did not exist. It was all an illusion. And it's still true on this basis that they would not exist were it not for the mind to be able to say they exist. So how are you going to say they exist? You can say, well, they do. And I say, well, if you didn't have the mind, would they? And if you have any ability to think, if you even come close to the city limits of Thinkville, Mississippi, then you surely get some suggestion of what I'm pointing to. If they cannot say they exist, do they exist? What was a wolf's name before we had the word wolf? For those of you that didn't get anything from that several nights ago. Are there such things as emotions? And you say, well, certainly there are. I can feel them. You feel something, and they're emotions. And you're, you're distinguishing that just between some sort of just crude physical sensation. Well, yes, because they're human emotions. All right, okay, I'm not saying they're not. But do they exist apart from the mind? 
Well, yes, they do. Because right now, I feel kind of yucky. I feel kind of aggressive. I feel kind of... I've been sort of down all day and it had nothing to do with my thinking. Because I've got no problems. There's no reason why. I woke up not feeling good. Well, how do you know it? Well, I, I, I don't feel good. Well, I mean, where do you hurt? Well, it's not hurt. Well, I'm talking about emotions. I'm not talking about that I'm in physical pain. I'm saying I don't feel good. But it, you're not hurting anywhere. No, I don't feel good. I emotionally do not feel good. Is that possible without the mind? Most people would shut down there, but I was hoping some of you could carry it on a bit further. That's part of the underlying hint tonight. That was it. <laughs> but if you look at the, back to what I was saying, that there is a potential useful purpose to consider the physical life of man, that lower circuitry as being representative of the past and what seems to be emotions of the apparent present because that's where men feel emotions. I feel bad now. And if you can understand that, then look at the intellect as being representative of the future. Even though you can say, well, I'm thinking right now. Yes, but aren't you thinking things you've already thought before? Ordinary people, it means nothing, but the rest of you, you must know by now. It's the top 40 over and over and over. The potential, the mental potential is the future. Uh, back up for one second. When I said that the emotions only seem to be a phenomenon of the present, uh, an ordinary person could argue that, and I could argue it for them staying right here. It's a waste of time, except there's that one useful possibility here. So I've tried to use it on people before to consider that would people that would say in all earnestness, people that think they're interested in such as this, that they say, well, I can't really get anywhere because I am so emotionally disrolled. I always have been. All my life I've been uh, sort of emotionally at loose ends, or I've always felt uh, neurotic in some way. I've always felt uh, overcome. I, I, I'm in bad moods. And to try and just point out this, which is not a piece of colloquial attempted wisdom, but is to say, all right, you felt this bad before. Yes. Did it last? Well, no. <laughs> and then we stand eyeball to eyeball, and they go, so? <laughs> which, which, of course, should have been my line, except for the different, with that different tone. To, it should have been, I went, so? But No. The emotions seem to only exist in the present, except when you're in that, when you're being led by that area of the human nervous system, right there at the old Cape Canaveral of the brain stem, <laughs> wherein you're supposed to blast off, as lovely as Florida is, as, as beautiful as the old hypothalamic area of the human brain is, that doesn't have to think about anything, doesn't have to talk, all it has to do is feel. But now it can talk, it just doesn't feel, it suffers. How do you know you suffer? Because I say I do. Okay. <laughs> but if you try to point out someone that seems to have some potential to hear and go, I cannot move. I just feel I suffer all the time. I, I, I can't explain it. I can't tell you there's any reason why. It's just I was born nervous. I was born with a faulty, yellow, emotional circuitry in me or something. Okay, okay. I'm not saying you're not. But I asked them. And you felt this bad before. You felt just like this, yes. And, this, and just as bad before. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I go, was it permanent? <laughs> and they know that the answer is no. But think of all the many reasons that they can't answer it. That they can't say no and get anything out of it. <laughs> they can say no, but then they wait for some response. And if I don't give it, then that no is followed by so. <laughs> like, what's the point? And if you have to point out the point... They are not going to get the point. It seems to be the present. And it makes the present, and I'm not saying that's a fair uh, description of what the present would be, but it's only emotionally that people feel the present. Physically, the body, does, the, physically, the body lives in the present, but it is never going to be if we're going to separate the body and speak of it as being distinct, that, that it could be distinctly felt or could exist. 
discreetly from the rest of man's circuitry. But if it did, it still can't express what the present is. It is simply either satisfied and calm or it's on the move trying to survive, searching for food, searching for shelter. But it has no conception of the present. It has no conception of time, but it certainly has no conception of the present. The mind, to speak of the present, can certainly conceive of it because it made up the concepts of time and the present. But if you ask the mind, where are you right now? It draws a blank. Because it cannot identify itself as existing right here. If you don't ask it, it does. In the same way that you ask a man, are you conscious? And he goes, well, yeah. Do you know what you're doing right this second? Well, sure. You know, what kind of dumb question is that? I mean, in the midst of all your great speech, and you were giving this thing, and doing, and you were doing this, and you were fixing that, and you were talking to me, when you were doing that, did you have any conception of you being right here presently? And as soon as you ask him, he goes, well, yeah. No. That doesn't count. That is not a conception of the present. It's not even a feel for the present. The mind is always somewhere else. And given its best shot, given what even the collective level would be a, the most positive spin on its aspirations, they're always in the future, although the mind certainly dwells in the past, can dwell in the past and does very often. But its potential lies in the future to what it could do, what it could think of, what it could be aware of, what it could conceive of. <laughs> So here you are left, now let's take it all back at the wide range collectively. No matter where you are, no matter that you are, if you are living right now in the bosom of an academic community, if you were on the faculty at Princeton, all your friends were on the faculty at universities, and your wife was a university, your husband was such a professor, and all your children were little budding <laughs> professors, and that you were a good Episcopalian, you're a good member of the Republican Party. You're a member of, of everything. You're a member of the uh, sustaining member of the Met, New York Philharmonic. And, you, and, you, and you, you didn't watch television. I'm just trying to give you a, a... You didn't watch television. You don't read the tabloids. You only speak with other intellectuals. Uh, you only speak about the... You, even your social chit-chat never is involved with uh, basketball, sports of any sort. It is only involved with your humanistic concerns over the plight of humanity. That that's what you and your friends talk about, even at a, on a social level. When you're sitting around cocktail hour, you do not talk about gossip about movie stars or sports figures. You talk about uh, the recent troubles uh, in some part of the Africa or the Middle East or the Far East and how it is affecting the uh, people there and how you might be trying to contribute in some way to an alleviation of their suffering. It all seems that you are representative of the highest aspirations that man has to offer. That's what I'm trying to get to in all that. Do you understand? There is no criticism of that. I am not making fun of it. It's very important. And it is always there. That there is a identifiable paradigm by which men attempt to measure, or which, by which men do mentally measure themselves at any given time in any given place. And I just tried to cover it all from sort of an American uh, 20th century, down near 21st century view. Given that, or for those of you who like it, you could be already past that point, so to speak. You could have been perhaps still in that same kind of environment, but you have now undertaken uh, through various ways and readings and studies and efforts on your own that you have now, at least in private, even undertaken what you consider to be your best shot at, the mystical quest itself. That perhaps you have gone through all this and you have risen academically and you uh, have a reputation intellectually and you found it still insufficient. And through whatever way you became interested in the quest for the secret itself. So what I'm saying is you may even believe in private. You may have no one to speak to about it. You may in private now believe that your aspirations are in fact above those that you previously held in the world of academia, the world of an intellectual, at which time previously you found no fault with, which you found no fault at the time, and with which now you find no fault with your peers, 
but you may now believe that your aspirations have now reached that of Buddha. Let's just say that you took up a Buddha or the Sufis. You think that you reread uh, Al Ghazar or Rumi, and you think you read it, and you think that's it. The man is speaking my mind. It may be 800 years ago. It may be in a foreign environment, but that is it. That's it. And you feel as though now a kindred spirit that I am now one with the aspirations of a Rumi and what he represented, or of a Muhammad or of whoever. You may believe that. But you got that from the collective aspirations of man. And if your personal aspirations do not go beyond that, if they are not expanded beyond that, you're doing nothing. You are not after any goal. You cannot prove that, and I certainly wouldn't argue with people, but you are not. And when it gets down to a more specific functional level, what it amounts to is, here it comes again. Get ready to be sort of gagged with beige wallpaper. Worse than that. <laughs> wallpaper paste for beige wallpaper. Here it comes. If you're thinking, using the same kind of materials that everyone else is, you're not thinking. Because that's what your aspirations amount to. There are no such things as metaphysical physical aspirations we've been through that it's only the simplest sorts of people they're no more than religious even though they may claim that they're on some mystical quest but if your aspirations do not rise above physical all you're involved with would be the kinds of rituals endemic to all religions if not lighting candles and making holy signs of the cross or playing with worry beads you would be doing something That the collective, that the faction of the collective with, which, with whom you are involved believe that by undertaking these physical rituals that you will in some way become a better person. That you will in some way become spiritually unfolded, revealed. If you believe that, go ahead. It is intellectually, or perhaps I should say in the mind, at least and a newcomer get distracted because it has nothing to do with education. And it has nothing to do with your IQ. It is intellectually wherein aspirations are formed. Because the body actually has no aspirations other than to live and they cannot be expressed verbally. Emotionally, which any of you, I gave you a strong hint tonight, but any of you who begin to see this kind of drawing in those interlocking circuitry, that is a it is a canard mm. it is a harmless fraud because it does not go in that sequence mm. but nor is that sequence incorrect when I say that that is not the sequence it is not that I can go up there and change it or say alright I'm going to tell you the truth the emotions go up there and the intellect goes here it's not that there is simply no such sequence as that once you get between the lower and the higher. All right, I'll hint again. The emotions are as real to most people, even people involved with such as this. For a long time, their emotions are as real, if not more so, to them. That is the way they feel than the way they think. But here's the question again. Get ready to gag. I know, I know how strong feeling is in your life, I would say to someone, to everyone. I know how strong it is. I know what an impediment emotions can seem to be. But would they exist? Could you not think about them? You mean a hint cruder? Well, I already played part of it. Any sane person would go, well, Yes. Feelings and thought are two different things. The sentence, they could say to me, the sentence rhetorically, I guess, makes sense. But it's, the whole idea is nonsensical. I've already said I don't feel good. I've already said that my feelings seem to be the focal point of my life. No matter that I try to think about ideas of a higher nature. I try to read about them. I even watch you, listen to you talk. But still, it's my feelings. That seems to be what I must shake myself loose from. They control my life. If 
fine, I understand that. They do everybody. More so than ordinary whiners believe. Yeah. Well, everyone, I didn't mean that insulting, everyone who, everyone who feels hurt feels it to be an individual pain at the time, and they feel that the degree of pain, the severity of it, is unique with them. So I could say to the person, I understand, that feelings seem to be the center of your life. They seem to be of more controlling, have more control over you than any thoughts you ever have. I understand that, but the question is, would they exist, could you not think about them? And they want to say, well, you know, why do you keep saying that? Because they're two different things. I'm telling you, I don't feel good. I, you know, I'm nervous, I'm depressed. I, I just, I'm always feeling uneasy. I always feel discomforted and disturbed. I understand, I hear you feel it. But would they exist, could you not think about them? Then they just give up. <laughs> I'm trying to hint stronger. There is no such sequence as that. There is no such arrangement as that. And there is no way that I can change it to make it more so. I can make it a little bit better, but no. I'd ruin it. All right, no, I could. It's still, well, I could, I could change the drawing a little bit and make it closer, but I would have to add a comment to have you project it into at least a four-dimensional realm and then picture the way I draw it. But hell, why should I do that? You got it right up in here. It's already there. All you got to do is consider the question, would my feelings, would I have the feelings I have were I not able to talk about them? Even though there they are. And your mind <clears throat> tells you that they're two different things. But the person will say, no, 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 it's not my mind telling me that. It's my feelings telling me that they're two different things. Oh, really? Now I hear your feelings talk? And they say, well, don't be silly. <sighs> You're right, I shouldn't be silly. <laughs> if you take the highest what back to being intellectually up to the point of wallpaper paste for the ever popular beige variety <laughs> whatever aspirations you can think of now no matter where they came from no matter if they fit specifically any examples I've used tonight, any aspiration you can think of, or if you want even cruder, anything that you think, no, I won't say that. I keep trying to make it too easy. Charitable. Nah, no, soft. Nah. No. Trying to dance around and, and losing battle. Yeah, that. Stop it. Okay. <laughs> If any, whatever aspirations you have now, whatever you, that you can say to yourself, that you can describe, are not aspirations. Any effort that you say that you're making to be less routine are invalid. Do you see, just taking it verbally, do you see that if what I'm describing is a genuine detailing of what's going on, as obscure as it may sound for a moment, but if you take that as being genuine, do you realize how far removed that makes someone attempting to do this? Because wherever you turn around and look in life, Whatever the aspirations, whatever seems to be, the aspirations, whatever are expressed by the highest within the collective. You people are supposed to know, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. Everyone else. If right now the United States, if right now Western Europe, if right now the world could come up with a vote, come up and say put up together committees and describe what should be the aspirations of man. Probably there's some version hidden in some document that's been put out by somebody like the United Nations or some subdivision of it of uh, one of their committees overseeing or in charge of expressing humanity's interest in the welfare and the human rights of others, whatever it is. 
If you took a manifesto that the whole world agreed, this describes what a man should be. This describes what, regardless of his religion, culture, national, uh, nationalistic background, herein, and they would probably do it in four or five lines, herein would be the ideal of man. This is what, this is the measure of man. This is to what we have always striven. And it would be a fine description because life would give it to them. Life has been pushing them with its little finger up one of their, it's pushing the parade. And so they would describe. It would be, the description would be impossible for ordinary people. That doesn't matter. If your aspiration does not go beyond that, now could we, at the final moments, at least you understand aspiration is also synonymous with uh, view, understanding, whatever heroic potential you have is what your aspirations turn out to be. But if you looked at the highest aspirations that collective man can conjure up, even though you can't do it right then, even though humanity can't, if you look at that and go, well, I don't know what an enlightened person is, I do not know what a more awakened man is, but just that description, even from that kind of routine, mundane source, the United Nations or the World Church, Council of Churches or somebody, <laughs> and you read it, and down there brings tears to your eyes, brings a little glow to your human heart, and you think that, they did it. I mean, I, maybe I'll never discover the secret, maybe I'll never be an enlightened person, but there, if I could just achieve that, I would have made something of my life. I would surely be a superior man. I would certainly be a better than ordinary person. No, you would not. Regardless of the fact that you're not there then, if that's all to which you aspire, if it does not go beyond that, that is, if your understanding doesn't go beyond everyone else is put together, you're just playing with this. Or for those of erotic metaphorical tendencies, you're just playing with yourself because you're not going anywhere. And there again is the trick because if an ordinary person's mind followed this up to this point, go, all right, tell us well, what is it then? Well, hey, if I tell you, you're back in the same boat. That's what you're left with. The entire system that makes up man, in particular in the higher realms, seems without any doubt to be operating on the win-lose. Either or, up-down, live-die basis. And therefore, when the mind hears, if it followed what I was just talking about and said, and I point out that any aspiration, any goal to which the ordinary human mind can conceive no matter how lofty it sounds, no matter that it's above your ability right now, if your understanding cannot go beyond that, then you're on to nothing. And then I said, well, an ordinary mind, if they followed that and went, okay, what's after that? They are then locked back to the position of, well, that's a criticism. So you're saying that there's a correct version. You're saying that no matter what humanity comes up with collectively as to being a description of what should be the proper goal of humanity, or at least of an individual man, to make him a fully realized person, you're saying that that's not it. Okay, that's what I'm saying. So tell us why it is. Tell us the correct version. There is none. And therefore the mind just absolutely just cuts it off. Because if it's not this, that means it's some other thing. And if it's not this, and you identified what it's not, I know you said you weren't criticizing, but still you said that's not it. Yeah, I did. All right, if you said that's not it, then that means there is an it. And if you're so smart that you know that's not it, then what is it? <laughs> oh, you want me to tell you? Yes, I do. So I tell them. And they feel like, well, let's assume that they took it as being, hey, that, I like that. They feel like, well, hey, I'm making some progress. Roll up my sleeve. Now I'm getting somewhere. Where? Your conception of your aspirations, your conception of what the goal is, has simply shifted. That you think, well, I learned something from you finally. You point out that the common... The aspirations that can be expressed by the collective, by man, the collective, is insufficient. You point that out, and I said, okay, what is it? And I finally got you to tell me what it was, so you told me, and I'll be damned. I was surprised, but you're right. It sounds correct to me. Your description is better. I won't go on that. 
You can if you want to, but you're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what you're faced with in life? <laughs> it's not to make you feel bad, because once you see it, not only does it simplify things, it'll save you all kinds of money, if, if for no other reason. Because no longer do you have to read, you don't have to buy, buy any books. You don't have to listen to anybody. It's just, it becomes very simple, not just the secret, but somewhere between here and actually experiencing the secret, it just becomes simple when you realize whatever's going on in life, of which my mind can conceive, it's of no value, but not in a critical sense. That the best I can think of, that's my goal in life, if that's the best I got, I've got no goal. If that's the best I've got, tra trying to tra chase that goal with my best intentions, with all my best effort, I will not move. Now this is, it, is a fact, as strange, I know as paradoxical as it can sound, but the point is, once you realize that, once you get a glimpse of it yourself, the chase, the quest becomes much more simple. It makes beige wallpaper look almost exciting. <laughs> it makes your whole idea of what a heroic life is change. Because it's not overcoming things, it's not overcoming people, it's not overcoming ignorance. It's overcoming beigeness. And if you get really good, it's overcoming the illusion of beigeness. There were once two kingdoms, one in the mountains, the other in the valley below, who seemed to stay in a constant state of low-level conflict, and between whom communications apparently ranged from scant to non-existent. But unbeknownst to either side was the existence of a third principality situated halfway up the mountains from the valley. Some animals once discovered some books in the jungle and eventually developed the ability to read them. And they were most intrigued by the ideas they found regarding emotions and discussed amongst themselves what these strange things might be. But after only a short while of their reading and discussing, they no longer had to wonder what they were. <laughs> they began having them. <laughs> Once upon a time, soon after man was created, the first nascent hero appeared, and for a while made tremendous strides, but was eventually struck down by his act of speaking. In the routine world of reality, yes, it is true. You can't have it both ways. That's why there is the realm of the hero. There is a myth concerning a warrior who gave up both of his eyes to the gods in exchange for the supreme wisdom. And such is still the requirement, although the word eyes is open to an alternative spelling. <laughs> the advantage to believing that you are disabled due to individually directed afflictions is that it relieves you of having to consider making any actual effort. Mm -hmm. At a transcendental